Hey, everybody. Thank you for lasting this long at Black Hat. Yeah. So we've uh, never done this before. So this is a new experimental format we're trying out. And you are the guinea pigs. And so we're going to uh, open up with some conversation amongst us. Uh, I'll introduce who we've got up here. All review board members. We are the part of the larger team that uh, selects the content and looks for trends and tries to steer uh, the direction. And then after we have a bit of a conversation, we're going to try to draw you into the conversation. We have microphones, people with microphones that will be able to uh, get them to you so everybody can hear your questions. And we want it to be more of sort of a, a conversational kind of question and answer. We've got a couple of topics we're going to explore. And uh, if you think we're exploring them in the wrong direction, that's your chance to jump in. So, uh, so I'm going to sort of act as a moderator and try to get the conversation going and, and inject some uh, color. So all the way on my right, I've got Jamie Butler. And then we've got uh, Stefano. We've got Vincenzo. And we've got the beast. <laughs> <laughs> and so we've each kind of uh, watched different talks at the conference. And uh, so seeing the talks on the submission and seeing the talks in person and then trying to create a narrative about what is the direction that we're all seeing in information and security. Know, what are the trends? Uh, and what does it mean for us? So some of the talks are just refinements of past techniques, but we thought that they were interesting refinements. Um, and other talks are maybe more illuminative, illuminating, showing us where things are going. Um, so I want to just kind of start off with everybody here. Yesterday we started planning the session and we started talking about the keynote and the implications of what Bernie had talked about, about the amount of data that's being generated, about the end of essentially Moore's Law and about having to do the compute at the data, because the data server farms are so heavy and so huge, you can't move the data to where the compute is. And we had such a good conversation, we had to stop, because <laughs> we want to kind of continue it here in front of you. So we each sort of have something we want to talk about, but I want to start it at the beginning of the Black Hat with uh, Bernie's contention about the compute speed and, uh, and the direction we're going. So I don't know if, if you want to jump in where we started yesterday on you know, do we generally believe that? I mean, that's, and then if so, what are the implications for, for us in security? You want to get started? <laughs> no, I mean, there's only two guys, like, like, he actually knows something about machine learning expert systems, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I'm just a, an observer. Um, so you used a lot of these techniques early on in all of your intrusion detection yeah. work, right? Where you're trying to classify. But you know, the, the point is that um, when you're working with security data, Security data is actually, r relatively speaking, small. Uh, you are not the volume. The volume of it is yeah. small, uh, with, with, relatively speaking to what we see in I don't know the banking industry or the uh, big retail industry. And this means that many of the techniques that we are using are actually relatively small scale. So when you try to do the same thing, like anomaly detection, for instance, and on large scale data sets such as banking transactions. And this becomes more and more true when you get closer to like the big processes or the credit card circuits that process enormous volume of transactions. Trying to learn useful things out of there is actually pretty challenging. And one thing that happens is that at some point, it is, it is not really a problem of computational power or memory because Luckily enough, they are still small enough that we can handle them. Um, but it becomes a problem of actually being able to uh, understand with your mind, starting from smaller examples, how these algorithms will work at scale. And the real, real, real sad truth to it is that if you are like me, an academic that looks to the practical side of the world as opposed to the imperium of the ideas, uh, you pick up many papers, many scientific um, papers and algorithms, and, and then you try to apply that to the real world data, and they fade, crash, and burn miserably. They, they fail even on the original data set. <laughs> just, <laughs> just so everyone is aware. Just, but. <laughs> that, that's a bit of consideration that I can completely concede. Um, but they fail because the examples are what we think are good examples. 
but in many cases they do not match reality anymore. Right. So that that's the challenge. So the is challenge that a competitive advantage then, though? If you're Google or Facebook and you have lots of data, the type of analytics you can perform are you can do real-world data analytics, where a lot of other people oh, yeah. don't have data. So I, I, I like to use the, 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 the terminology that our common friend, Don Brzezinski, yeah. used to me um, when I was trying to push him to actually talk to the black hat crowds again about the stuff that he's doing yeah. at Amazon. And he said, well, you know, I could talk about what, what I have done at Amazon, but besides all of the implications, the usual corporate implication, there is one big implication. It, we are working with alien technology. It's yeah. technology that it's only useful to us. There's nobody else in the world that has the same problem. We are kind of a singularity. Right. And we are solving problems that only we have and conceivably will have in the future. So this is the, well, what, who was saying, I think one of you guys was saying the problem with, with Google on some of their uh, algorithms is they don't know what it's doing. Yeah, I mean, like the, I think. Like it's the, like it's beyond the, per like you were saying, it can't be conceived of in one mind anymore. So the problems have now gotten so complex, you're almost taking it on faith. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think also like the point is not just about the specificity of the problem is also about the fact that their solution would not work for anybody else because they don't have access to the same data sure. and computational resources. And I think, I mean, the, the nice, apparently, the nice thing about a lot of the actually, the, the, of the machine learning algorithms that actually work is that at some point you don't know why. Um, and, and that is a problem that, like, if you talk to anybody who's doing, like, large-scale machine learning at Google or even, like, at edge funds, that's what they will tell you. They will tell you that, like, they don't know how to change things because, like, they think that the current state works and they don't know whether the next iteration will work or not. Uh, in the security context, though, do you think that we need to understand how the algorithms work? Like, usually people in security are going to be more skeptical, right? right? So you have to show them how you arrived at your answer for them to start trusting a new technology because everybody says data science and, and machine learning and things, but... Well, so, so I think the problem, and I mean, maybe, maybe Stefan could talk a bit more about this. I think in general, the problem with data science seems to be the fact that you need to have a guy that has the main uh, expertise on whatever subject you like your your data comes from and then you need to have a guy that actually knows math and then you need to have a guy that actually knows how to program and <laughs> trust me finding one that can do all of these things is impossible uh, and so the issue is like the security dude doesn't need to know about like the algorithm that works best. The problem is you probably lose at some point the intuition that you would need to find the best match because like Imagine you are the math guy. I can talk to you about the problem and like the the, the, the domain, but uh, there will always be things that I have in my head that I'm not expressing to you, and so you cannot have that immediate intuition that I would have in my field and vice versa. So that that creates a interesting challenge. So I'm right. So I agree that you you know need those different skill sets, and it's probably not one person. Um, but in the security context, right, like if, if you're presenting data to the user and you're mm -hmm. going to tell someone their, their network's infest, in, infected, their particular hosts are infected, like the next question a, you know, a consumer of the product is going to come back and say, well, how do you know this? Or how did you right. arrive at this answer? And so sometimes in, you know, Stefano can correct me if I'm wrong, but sometimes in machine learning it's, it's difficult to express oh, yeah. How you got to the end? It, it is a, it is actually basically the reason why anomaly detection has never taken place. It's not that we don't really well. Part it is that we don't really know how to do that well. But it, the most of the problem is that an anomaly detector will tell you, okay, this machine is behaving strangely, and then most of the <laughs> and, and that's not yeah. actionable, right? You don't know what well, yeah, to do. So it. define it's, strange, it's, yeah. define strange and, and and tell me what do we need to do to fix it. Yeah. And that's the reason why people prefer to buy uh, measures detectors that do not work as opposed to buying anomaly detectors that may work. Because, you know, uh, measures detectors will tell you things that are outdated, things that maybe are not relevant, 
But when they tell you, they give you a, 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 yeah. a load of information that you can use to, to actually tell if it's relevant or not. So does this mean, though, that the future we're moving to is to deal with this, this data that's coming, we have to move to these systems that we don't fully understand? You know, for the speed of response, for the volume of data, we have already done that. Sometimes you, are, you, you, you try to do transactions with your credit card, and it triggers something, and it gets blocked. And if you ask the operator on the other end of the phone, why was this transaction blocked, they cannot even answer but, you. But I mean, you as a, as a business, and you're looking in this future, and you're like, I've got to start buying products. In the old model, I bought signature detection. In the new model, I'm buying anomaly detection or some kind of machine learning that knows that the execution environment is wrong, but it's not the same as a signature. So does it just mean the same concept as I'm running something on the host that tells me when something's executing improperly? The old magic was signatures and the new magic is expert system? Uh, and it'll be like now with expert systems. Now, hearing someone using the term expert system yeah. makes me feel much, much like when an old yeah. lady hears calling her, her name before getting married. Yeah. Um, but because it's a very, very old name that, that, has, that we, we didn't use anymore. But you are perfectly right. Um, the, the, the point is that we will need to change the way we respond to security threats if we are using this type of systems. Because we will get, basically we will get the response without knowing why the response was there. Um, and, and this is a very, uh, is a very typical thread in, in, in all artificial intelligence branches. Um, you, you can find this in robotics, for instance. So people have moved sorry away. To interrupt, but so, so does that mean when you're doing incident response, now you get a packet and you look at it and you go, aha, in the future you'll get an alert from an AI system and it says 92% something's weird, and now you're going to need the incident response guy that can commune with the AI to even get to the, <laughs> well, get to the point to like, how do you an, feel? Why were you image. unhappy 91%? Well, well okay, but, but this, brings to, brings, this potentially brings us to another point, which is if you essentially, every time your expert system or whatever tells you, okay, this is maybe weird over a certain, certain threshold, threshold. Yeah then potentially the right thing to do is just to disconnect the, the machine and buy a new one. Unless you start caring about <laughs> attribution, which brings yeah, us to another, yeah. to, to another potential topic of, of, of discussion. But uh, Let's so, go there. What's your topic? Attribution? No. I oh. no, no, no. I think like, so another thing that we, we, we discussed yesterday at lunch uh, was kind of like, I think the implication between um, the fact that a lot of people are not learning anymore stuff about oh. like low level architectures and things like that. And I think a good right that, that everything has become so abstracted and it's a framework yeah. and it's a meta framework and yeah. it's right and, and a good uh, and I guess a good way to pivot from our previous topic to this one is that when you design systems like those, you will start to deal with. Uh, multi-threading, multi-processing, Hadoop, and all sorts of like weird things. And the problem is, okay, actually, how many of you have written a memory corruption exploit in this room? Written. Yeah. Wr written a memory corruption exploit. Okay, so... Very few of you. All right, fair I don't, enough. I don't believe that, really. But. Well, okay. <laughs> anyway, so, so as all, all the people that have written memory corruption exploits in this room know, uh, when you start dealing with like multi-threaded applications, things become really, really weird. Uh, now imagine, like, imagine that you need to do that at scale on whatever penetration testing engagement. How do you, how do you deal with that? And w I think the question we got to yesterday was, will we get to a point where because nobody knows how to do that stuff, uh, essentially nobody will be like we will be able to neither secure nor potentially attack that level of the infrastructure so we will need to all deal with like web apps and stuff like that and so it, this is the if if you if it costs too much money to learn how to attack those systems the only people that will be the people with the right economic incentive if any yeah and well, and so we were joking, though. Uh, Bernie was, was saying, like, how many people know exactly why the compiler spits out certain bytes, exactly knows how when it goes and gets put down on a yeah. silicon mesh, like, why the gates end up getting arranged. And 
the number of people who can understand that is getting smaller and smaller, and the people who are running these frameworks is getting larger and larger. And so it's, the joke is, you know, do the people, who has more power in that world, the low-level guy or the high-level guy? So let's see a show of hands. Who would you rather be if you're trying to take over the world? The low-level guy or the framework guy? Low-level? Yeah, and the framework guy. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think the low-level guy takes the cake because everything else depends on it. You're taking over, subverting the lowest level in the architecture, and it looks like fewer and fewer people understand how it actually operates. On the other hand, to cheer up those that raise their hand for <laughs> framework guy, if yeah. they are looking for a, for a job, yeah, being that's, a framework oh, yeah. guy is yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yes. They'll be employed. <laughs> they will be employed. Not and those guys are necessarily yeah, the low-level guys would just be bitter, and sometimes that's <laughs> <what I'm talking. laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but that is a really interesting. And if you look at the proliferation of frameworks, the CPU yeah. still operates the same way it's operated since the day it was created. But since then, there's like fifty thousand new frameworks. Yeah, and I mean, I I joke a lot with a friend of mine. With Probably a lot of you know Albert Flake, and we we always talk about like because both of us have I guess interest in machine learning <laughs> recently, and we talk about the necessity of uh, having knowledge about like C plus plus and assembly, and what like what people tell you is that these days with Python you can do everything. Uh, the reality is that Python breaks very very easily in terms of like ability to scale. And yeah, it, it scales and then it stops. Yeah, because yeah. I mean it wasn't designed for, for for that purpose. But but I think another issue is is there um, I think something we also touched on yesterday is when when even like here or most conferences, what you see is that the people talking about kind of like lower level stuff, what they're doing is not to uh, go deeper into kind of like a specific lower level problem. They just changed the, the playing field. So in the past, you used to have talks about like browser exploitation. And then you went on to iOS exploitation. And now we're doing, I guess, cars. Next year, we'll do fridges until like we'll get to a point where like essentially we... we it's the same thing repurposed in a new green field. Yeah, we, which by the way, I mean, it has value in the sense that when like when you're dealing with like a different environment you want to learn about about the environment and so if somebody did that kind of like learning part for you it's it's Well useful. yeah it's like when people did Wi-Fi and then they wanted to learn about low power so then they right. learned about Zigbee so then right. Zigbee got beaten up right. and then you know they move along but they're not necessarily doing something brand new they're yeah. just lateraling Yeah I mean it's it's I guess it's breadth versus depth yeah. And and the issue, and I think this is also something that we were talking about in, in terms of education, like how do you educate people on the deeper level of things? Does it, first of all, does it make sense? And then what are the economics there? So it's... I think we had a question over here, this gentleman. Wait, wait, wait for the microphone. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering how it compares with, you're saying low level versus high level. I mean, how many people still compile or write in assembler or how many people are using toolkits now so i don't agree that working at a low level is a better way of operating oh we're not saying it's a better way of operating we're saying it will give you more power and ultimately all the security bugs uh if you understand yeah, yeah if you understand what's happening at the low level you can exploit classes of vulnerabilities that people at higher levels will never even see but do you really think that even though people don't know how to code in assembler, uh, they don't know how to exploit maybe the boot sector on a disk drive, yes, that, yes. that stops them? Absolutely. The, yeah. Absolutely. Like you can you can watch or like see some tutorial for a very I don't know standard way of exploiting thing, uh, a thing. But then to go from there to any level of novelty. Like there's no way you can do that unless like and, and again this does not imply that like you write assembly code all day. It just implies that unless you understand how the machine and architecture works, you're you're not maybe, going to be maybe able to. Maybe that example to you're do saying that. the two students, the one that understood. Yeah. So there was um, I was at a company and we had two interns from a, a Ivy League school and and um, we were talking about. 
exploitation and buffer overflows and things like this. This was a while back. Um, and the, these, this was a very prestigious university that they both came from and cost a ton of money to go to. And the, the one, um, when we, we started writing out some uh, hex bytes that would be the, the machine code for the exploit, and the, the computer science person, um, her training hadn't been in anything low level, so she didn't understand C, she didn't understand pointers, she didn't understand machine code. Um, so she didn't quite get what we were doing, but the other uh, woman that was an intern was a computer engineer um, by her degree. And of course, she has the program VHDL and things like that. And so she, under, she understood so immediately. So as soon as you started doing the hex bytes. Yeah, as soon as we started doing the hex, she understood like, oh, my, this is going to be machine code. And, and she got it like right away. Yeah, and I mean, I think another, another point in that sense is that a lot of the uh, new attacks you see are essentially either due to some major technological shift, either because like things drop in price, which could be the case for like basement attacks, or is somebody that gains a deeper understanding of a specific, maybe, I don't know, CPU or problem. And then and he finds, to... yeah, and he finds a way to to like take the next step towards the, I guess, attack path. And this was the case for, I mean, I guess recently the problem with DRAMs, but uh, it was also like it's almost always the the case, even originally with like stack overflows or stack base buffer overflows versus heap overflows. Like for a while, people thought that like heap overflows were not exploitable. Uh, and like if you don't understand how the underlying system works, you will probably keep thinking that. Now, am I saying that everyone should know how that stuff works? Absolutely not. Uh, also because if you but, want but to- But if you look at the trend, we're getting more of one and less yeah. of the other. Yeah. And that's not healthy because probably. Because our systems are more large scale though, right? We right. couldn't deploy an Amazon cloud. Well, that's the thing like is that. how, <laughs> is, as professionals, how will we survive in this new world where, all right, I don't have an Amazon cloud, you don't have a Google instance or whatever. So how will we ever get as individuals this skill unless we go and work for a mega company <laughs> And work on a big team. Well, that, that's actually that's actually kind of a separate problem, right? It's uh, it's the problem of availability of the test system for for people. So, usually, what happens is that even when you have uh, interesting stuff, whatever it is, from mm -hmm. automotive to aircraft to whatever else, whatever happens is that cool hacks, cool interesting uh, attack vectors begin to be developed when people who have the knack for attacks, so hackers, get their hands on some of these. Yeah. So, um, and in that well, sense... I think one of the interesting things that drew me into kind of hacking was it's, it's kind of you against the machine and you can play along at home yeah. and affect major systems. Um, and so it's a, it's a game, it's intriguing, right? But like you were saying, and Jeff, we are talking of things that the statute of limitations as statute of limitations, <laughs> hopefully, yeah. it's taken away, right? So, it, I just wanted to. You we're know, not going to go into the definition <laughs> of hacker, okay? yeah. <laughs> yeah. but I think you know, Jeff, you were saying that you know you, you don't have access to these large scale systems and and things like that. You can't possibly emulate the environment. Yeah, or if I attack the system, I don't get the logs. So I can't see what my results are. Yeah, you know, yeah I can yeah. run an instance on Amazon, but I don't know what's happening in the back end. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and this was this is for for instance the case now with uh, the developments in automotive with people actually developing toolkits to play with automotive devices. Yeah. And for instance, it's not the same case with um, aircraft. Yeah. Because basically, aircraft, play, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, there, there's a there's a few cool people actually at Airbus and Boeing playing with with those, but. Um, it's obviously not in general availability. So right. unless you go to work for EADS or for one of its contractor or for yeah. Boeing or one of its contractors, well, you will not. Would you will just not do that? And so that that's an interesting thing. Who here, by show of hands, who here is self-taught? You got interested. You found stuff online. Who here thought that this was going to be like a career and you pursued it intentionally? And then there's just a whole bunch of people here because <laughs> they just showed up at the room. There's this leaping part. Yeah, this is, this is a rant, Fred, rant. So I would say in the early days, a lot of it was self-directed, but now there's economic demand. 
right? And yeah. So yeah. now they're they're trying to create career paths. It's it's it, it's very very difficult. I mean, I mean, I, I and you you being an academic, yeah, right? <laughs> You're one of the gateways. And, right? But it's difficult. Uh, it's it's such, uh, so one of the most difficult questions that they still get asked. Well, there's two. There's one that I get asked for stu from student, and one that I get asked from my colleagues. The one that I get asked from students is, how do I get into info security? I want to be a penetration tester. I want to be an info security professional. What, sh what courses what should, should I, I do? take? Yeah. What should I do? What classes? What books? What? And it's an amazingly difficult question to answer. Yeah, every other because field, you, you, <laughs> there's a path. Yeah, because, because we were self-taught. <coughs> and we have not yet built, I feel, uh, like a path for people mm -hmm. that want to enter. And the other thing is what I get asked from my colleagues, which is one of these two alternate forms. It's how do you teach people whatever is it that your subject is about? Yeah. And the other form is why do you teach people to break software? <laughs> does it, why should you teach that? Right. And but one is like the legitimacy of the field. Yeah. And, and the other is how do you teach that? And actually, yeah. if, if I think about it, I cannot really figure out a way to teach people how so this to is the, break new things. So is this the nurture versus nature debate, right? Yeah. Either you think like a hacker, or we can train you to think like a hacker. That's precisely what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. And the problem is that, at least for me, I can think of ways to train people to write a buffer overflow, but I'm not so sure that by training them to write buffer overflows, heap overflows, and heap spraying, there will be among them the next uh, Vincenzo Yozzo or Beast that will develop the next thing. Right. The one that I cannot teach them yet. Right, but isn't the Occam razor here the fact that essentially you teach people how, how computer works? Like you go study computer engineering or science, and then depending on your inclination, you will either become a software engineer or an hacker or whatever else. Like, do we really think we're that special that we need? Uh, well, so, so that's why I want to bring Beast in the conversation. Beast is very active uh, in Korea with the best of the best program where the government seeks out and has a whole program, a nine-month program, to try to train people to be essentially hackers. Yeah. So why don't you, so, so what have you learned? You've been doing it for a couple of years. You know, do you build hackers or you take an innate skill and then build on what they already have? So, um... I mean, there's no certain way to uh, make people skilled hackers. I mean, if somebody knows that, I mean, they, they could have really good power. But uh, I, I believe nobody knows that yet. So South Korea needs a lot of hackers because we have North Korea. <laughs> but, I, mean, <laughs> I was kidding. I mean, uh, the every industry needs hackers. I mean, security experts. So we started this uh, since 2013. So uh, we were thinking about how to uh, make good hackers. So because the pro the program is supported by the government, so which means we have budget. So uh, we were thinking like the um, that there are a lot of people, a lot of students in Korea. They are interested in computer security, but uh, we were uh, we di we didn't have any idea which two students we which what students we were gonna take because there are so many players. So we we're thinking like uh, okay. If there's someone who went to the good university and a good uh, computer science skill, maybe, but he doesn't have any idea on this computer security, uh, we gotta take them. Or um, it's like there's a young guy, like 16, but he always knows the computer security, but he's uh, really still get a study. I mean, at school. Yeah. So, so you have to filter out, right? They might have academic credentials, yeah. but no so, actual. Well, well, we start. I mean, we we get like a 50 50 50, 50 students, oh, both 50. of them, but uh, we don't we don't get the answer yet because we don't know the the certain way to the teach people. I mean, so it's like um, but so you get all these applications, yeah. you screen them down, yeah, based on a skill test or something, True. right? Yeah, yeah, and then you whittle them down from a thousand people to maybe you accept a couple hundred, right, down to the ten best, yeah, right. right? And so along that pathway, are there certain skills of who, the, the 10 best always seem to have certain skills, like they're very quick at learning, or they're very generalizable sure. skills, or they always come from a certain, yeah. what are you finding there? Like, what are the, like if you were hiring, and you wanted to hire for those skills, what would they be? Hmm. 
or teach those skills, right? Because if you can figure out what that is, then it can inform academic. That's the point. Well, well but okay. so, sorry, sorry to in interrupt. But like, um, so for instance, uh, what's the name of the guy? Thomas Fashik. Yeah. yeah. So he's starting a new company, right? Based mostly on essentially ways to change. Uh, the hiring processes used, especially in Silicon Valley, to hire, to yeah. hire both like developers and security people. And kind of like some of the things that he was saying is that a lot of the people he hired uh, for Matasano, so as security consultants, actually had no security background whatsoever. Uh, what they were, one of them, this Alex guy, nobody knows who he is, but he was doing like DBA management somewhere. And then he started to do, he started to do the um, challenges that like Matasano has, and then he got a job. Uh, so for there. those who don't know, so Matasano, uh, Thomas Chasek, he wrote, he's, he's into cryptography. So he started, I think it's about 23 or 30 steps, and he started with a very general, simple puzzle. That, and anybody can do this online. You can go there, he, there these challenges, anybody can participate in. But when you do the first step, it's very small and you, you, you understand it. And you might do the second step and then a week later you might do the third step. And then you might get to the fifth step and you don't realize but over the first four steps you were learning something new and you have to put it all together to solve the fifth step. But you know, by doing them in small bite sized pieces you don't realize you're building the foundation for the next skill. And it turns out that that True. is a really powerful way to teach people. That's why I recommend the people are playing on the CTF, mm -hmm. that's the flag. Yeah. And, and I mean, so I think another example is, uh, was it for, for Cisco? So I think, uh, Alvar, was it for Cisco the plane ticket for uh, uh, whatever woman was able to resolve the, okay, and she was doing something else before, right? Okay. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> it should end. so, so, yeah, so, did. so yeah. besides the conversation that we could have on uh, problems of like sexism in, in the in the industry, which we should probably not talk about, uh, <laughs> not here. Also, uh, because we are five guys. Yes, but, stage, but, so. but 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 I think the, the 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 bigger point is that what matters, and which goes back to the question I was asking Stefano, is do you actually need to teach? specific things or if you have somebody with a strong enough background in computer engineering or computer science right. and if he has I guess the he or she has the natural attitude towards right. security. So, I think I think one of the biggest things though in the industry is um, you really need to have the curiosity, right? Like it's not a it's not a nine to five job. Like right. you know when you're young like you have to put all your energy into that one field. But isn't that really, the same, like, if you want to be the badass doctor versus well, just yeah, exactly. the average but, doctor, right. So that's probably pretty normal. It's totally the same. About yeah. it. the, only, the only significant difference that I can say is that usually acres are, at least in our generation, well, our generation, <laughs> excluding Vincenzo, <laughs> because it's another generation. Uh, but, uh, I'm young too. He's in his own too. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know your age, but I know he's. So, um, in, in our generation, at least, we were self taught. So, the, the dedication that you, that, you, that you mentioned is that it's because we needed to build by night the, the, the solutions to the problems that we found by day, basically, yeah, because we, yeah. we, were, yeah. we were solving that. By, but, by ourselves. But it's that curiosity that makes you challenge. Absolutely. I think that's a trait challenge. that gets you to the top of the field. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I think. Of any field. No. Of any field, right. But I don't think it's. What we need now, though, is we need scale. Like, we yeah. keep talking about scale. It's like, <laughs> just in Washington, D.C. alone, I think there's like, they keep saying about six, 7,000 jobs open. Well, DHS or somebody just opened 3,000. 3,000. Cyber, <laughs> cyber, yeah, 3,000 for DHS. DOD wants, I think they wanted 5,000. Yeah. Never mind the defense contractors in Silicon Valley. So the problem is. We can't produce, and that's just in one part of the country. Um, so I, I'm just wondering, are we like the curiosities? There's a question. Yeah, and I think, I think this is Interpol over here. <laughs> Hello, Thank Interpol. You. Thank you. Uh, my name is Vitaly Kamluk. I'm actually from Kaspersky Club at Interpol. So I'm seconded here to Interpol uh, based in Singapore. Just short uh, introduction. Uh, guys, you're discussing here uh, educating and breeding hackers. <laughs> But, however, from my perspective, I think there are so many hackers worldwide, and every single developed country, more or less developed, 
they all, all have some kind of a cyber offensive capabilities already mm -hmm. up and running for many years. Some of them are not yet exposed probably, but there are many of them that have been discovered and mm -hmm. you, all of you know about that. So, yeah, the point is, is, is we should discover and train them before you need to discover, <laughs> discover them. That's, that's pretty much the point, maybe. No, no. Basically, uh, my point is that we, have li we are living in a very interesting time from my perspective because we have reached the point, at least, well, I feel it very well, uh, probably from, starting from this year, uh, people lost trust in all technologies around us. They lost trust in the network. They lost trust in hardware and in software because, you know, everything can be forged, faked, uh, interdicted, intercepted, uh, and stolen. And if you, if you trusted encryption before, I think since uh, a couple of years ago, there is no trust in that anymore as well because uh, the algorithms can be altered, can be changed, can be somehow you know, yeah. modified in the way that it, they are not protecting you anymore. So people lost trust in technologies. And for me, it's kind of obvious now. So the question for each of you now, and I'd like you to express your opinion individually, uh, was it a favor of humankind or was it a plan? What, was it a plan that we lose our trust in? Was it somebody's plan to make us uh, vulnerable from the very beginning? Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll take that first. I don't think it was anybody's plan. I think it's normal market forces, mm -hmm. right? You don't get rewarded for building something safer. You get rewarded for being first to market. And by doing that, you necessarily don't have time to research and figure out every failure mode of the system. And so it's just we're moving too quickly and there's no incentives to fix things. So or very little incentive to fix things. And, yeah. But it's now added up to reach a critical mass where there's no other backstop. Or before we would say, well, we don't really trust the software, but we know the hardware. Well, we don't really trust the hardware, but we know the algorithm. But now the, the problem you've pointed out is we've gotten to the point where we're, there's so many things we don't trust, it creates this mental, um, like a, not a malaise, but an inevitability, right? You sort of expressed it, which is, I just give up. I can't trust anything. And then you start thinking in this defeatist attitude, uh, and, and then you know, how do you go forward from there, right? You need to trust something, some grain of salt, something. And, uh, and so that's what I fear for our industry is if we just kind of give up, it's too hard, there's too many attack vectors. Um, then I, I think that's sort of so, that's not healthy. So to, to add to this point, uh, I beg your pardon, I'm going to use you as a scapegoat for the Interpol and every other uh, <laughs> government organizations that deals with cyber stuff. Now, to, to what Jeff was saying, there's no, maybe this is changing today because people are not trusting technology anymore, but for the longest time, there was no interest in securing stuff. So if anything, the people that were supposed to like raise a red flag and say, hey, maybe we should think twice before allowing these companies to deploy software this way and so on and so forth, should have been governments or Interpol or Europol or whoever you want to like. Somebody should have to, to said about. this is risky. Yeah, and it should have been the public sector, not the private sector, because the, pri the private sector had no incentive. Now, I think what I'm trying to say is that it wasn't anybody's plan, but it should have been somebody's plan to think that this was going to happen sooner or later. And when you think, when you think of where we are today in terms of policy, it's still mind blowing that nobody actually has a decent enough understanding of this, of technology and this space to actually come up with reasonable. Fifty uh, years of computing, and we still have yeah. no real policies. Uh, yeah, I, but, but that's but that's really the point, right? Uh, and 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 thank you very much for using my scapegoat uh, from the point of view of a, of an employee of the Italian government. I'm happy that it's <laughs> the blame for all government employees ever. But well, um, I mean, you work in university. Yeah, right? so it's kind different. of different. Um, but that's pretty much the point. You yeah. say it's been fifty years, but come on, how long did it take aviation to become safe? Yeah. Well, I, I guess I, I don't want to totally go in this direction, but really, I want to see by a show of hands, there's no liability for poor software. 
right? We are operating with no liability. Wow, that's amazing. No other industry has that, right? <laughs> we are living in a bubble universe where we have no liability for the stuff we do, really. And if you look at Boeing or Airbus, they write millions of lines of code in a life safety critical system, and it goes in an airplane, and they're liable, right? And that's why their stuff works most of the time. Right, and then auto manufacturers, millions of lines of code, Tesla, millions of lines of code, and they're liable. But when you take millions of lines of code and you put it in an online database, an Oracle <laughs> database or whatever, that's whole, handling medical records that's life critical, no liability. Like, I'm curious, how long can we honestly expect our industry to let us get away with that? Where everybody else has liability except us, and we're the area that's holding all the king, keys to the kingdom? Like, I don't see how we're going to be... Governments are not going to let us get away with that forever. And when that changes, I think that's going to be the big paradigm shift. I totally agree. So I'm curious on your... I, Am I, I smoking I, crack? Or? No, no, I totally agree. Yeah. But, uh, well, <laughs> yeah. It's a different question. This is not a different, do you really want me to answer that question? Or yeah. you want to, I, I, to I mean, it? especially in Singapore, I don't think that's yeah, yeah, the no. type of okay. conversation we should have. So, add. yeah, that's but, a line of conversation that okay. we will drop here. Um, but it's, that, absolutely, it's absolutely the point. So um, the point is that, the point we was trying to make with the airplane example is that when the... Um, the aviation turned from, you know, a technology into an industry. Then it was liability and the need to build confidence mm -hmm. that actually took it from being like, okay, let's try to land this thing on this field where there's no light, there's no instruments, there's no radar, and let's hope that the fog does not come down at the wrong time, right. to the place where it is today without any sort of liability, without any sort of market incentive, we, we already have a market incentive for security. Actually, Yeah, but we, have, we, we actually, you actually, have contributed, may, maybe more than most people in this room, to create at least part of a pressure on vendors yeah. to fix their software. Right, but, but our power through Black Hat is only the name and shame. Yeah. So, so can I play yeah. devil's advocate here? Yeah. Uh, I think it is a, it's a case of be careful what you wish for. Because, I mean, the problem is the more regulation we will get oh, in yeah. the software industry in general, the more margins will go down, which yeah. means all your shiny new startups will not start, and which means well, all of our salaries will go down, or and so on and yeah. so forth. So right, but the, look at the alternative, right? Is it acceptable for governments to allow no liability in this area? No, 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 no absolutely. But but I think like I think what would be mature to do would be to actually have a private sector conversation and be like. Right. Do we really but the, the private sector will only have those conversations under threat of regulation, right? right? We'll do the right thing because you're going to force us to. But I'm just, I'm just pointing out in, in my lifetime, this will happen, I think, because it's, the systems are becoming too important to not oh, yeah, have yeah, liability. Absolutely. I'm just curious so how the... Who imposes the liability? I mean, I was hoping to be insurance companies yeah. through rates yeah. and market forces. Right. But if it's not insurance companies, I don't see we get a free pass. Yeah, it's probably I, I know a few years ago, I was... Okay, I'm sorry, we've got a question. Hello, um, I really like the comparison of the uh, yes, airplane industry moving from a technology to an to a industry. And I think the same is currently happening in, if it comes to security, maybe software security or network security. So I ha had the chance last year to uh, have a private talk with Melissa Hathaway. I think mm -hmm. she should be well known. Melissa Hathaway? Yes, yeah. yes. And uh, she was also elaborating that uh, in the U.S. they are starting campaigns right now that companies, if they have a security breach, will make uh, made hold liable for that breach. And right now, also insurance companies are stepping onto the horse and looking how to um, protect small companies uh, about all these issues. So I think we are currently also in the shift of moving from a technology to a more bigger industry. Yeah, I think in the United States, I don't know, another, I'd be interested in hearing what other countries are doing. In the United States, last I checked, there were 63 insurance companies that were offering cyber insurance. I'm sure the number's greater. And the, the interesting thing is when I talk, like Zurich Insurance is a big player in this area, Liberty Mutual, Aon, um, is 
they've moved now from the checklist. You report on yourself and tell us how many systems you have and how they're deployed, and we look at that and we give you an insurance quote, to now they'll deploy their own on-site or remote red team testing, and they'll validate for themselves what you tell them. So on one hand, that means full employment for red, test, red team testing <laughs> if because all these insurance companies are going to want to validate what these companies are telling them, um, which might keep them more honest. But I think that's the paradigm shift, right? Insurance is starting to get involved. And in the United States, we have 50, 48 different breach notification laws. So there's 48 standards. But pretty soon, in, some, in the next four or five years, we'll pass a national notification law. And once there's a standard notification rule, the statistics will be gathered on those breaches. And that will start to inform insurance. And then we'll see the insurance industry. That'll be one thing that helps insurance industry grow up. So if you're in a different country that, that's already gathering statistics, I'd be really curious. But this is kind of trickle down. Right, but liability, right? right? So you're you're holding the companies that are breached liable, or they're yeah, you're already, blaming the victim. Yeah, yeah, they're already paying a huge price if they get breached. Like you have to issue right. new credit cards, you have to provide credit insurance and things like that. But you know the the industry, the providers of the software that's providing the protection, right, aren't held liable because you can't. Yeah, if you can't hold the manufacturer liable, yeah, it's a shift of blame. Yeah. So uh, I'll go to the audience for another question. If anybody has one. Over there. Yeah, over there. He must be a hacker because he's in the last row. <laughs> um, I have a question regarding like the normal people. Like you already addressed like the vendor side and the poli policy side. Yeah. But like what about the people like all the people I know are like kind of obsessed with the complex and more complex, everyday more complex way of living. Like, who needs a light bulb which can be turned off over the Wi-Fi? Like, I don't know, like really, like, I love technology and there are a lot of things I like to do with it and like to play around with it, but like no one is like putting the blame of the, on the people who are getting like kind of to like a more complex way of living. Yeah, the creating dangerous technologies. Yeah. So I wanted just to know your perspective on that. Like, how do you think normal people could like start being more aware of actually the technology they're using and the, the fact that when they rely on light bulbs, which can yeah. be turned on over the Wi-Fi, they're actually um, well, exposing themselves to. Well, I'll start off and then we'll see you get your take of the panel. But I don't think as a consumer, it's you shouldn't have to worry about this stuff. By the time it hits the mass market. You should make some assumptions like you should assume it's safe. You don't have to be a computer security expert to screw in the light bulb, right? Like my mom should not have to be a computer security expert to browse online, but she kind of has to be in, in today's world. She doesn't have to be an automotive expert to drive her car. The safety systems just work. But in our field, we still sort of you know, blame the victim a little bit. Um, like, oh, you shouldn't have bought that you know, yeah. network connected house smoke detector. Ha ha ha, you know, you idiot. It's like, <laughs> it's like, but wait a minute, it was on the shelf. I bought it, I plugged it in. Isn't it going to do what it said it should do? And it's like, but, 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 go ahead. So I think, I mean, a bigger problem is not from a security perspective, it's from a privacy perspective, which brings us to a slightly different problem. Because, like, if people start to die because of, like, computer security problems, those will be fixed and they will go away. M most likely. With massive regulation and With overreaction. Massive, yes. and, and yeah. so, but the bigger problem is all the privacy aspect of all of that. Because realistically, yeah. you as a consumer don't want, like, don't, you don't want to deal with the privacy implication of things. Because like, you have better things to do with your life. At the same time, you want to have the latest shiny things because all, all of your friends have that. So the problem becomes, can, like, is there a nice trick to deal with that? And kind of like the joke, I think one of the jokes on Twitter was for like how long the ads industry can subsidize the tech, tech, technology yeah. industry. Yeah. Uh, and probably like depending on who you talk to, the answer is forever. Uh, but and so, so, so the, what happens you know, when the ad agencies have everything on everybody? There's nothing new to mine, right? Right. And, and so I, I mean, that, that's the part that scares the crap out of me a lot more than the security. Yeah, like also, the purely secure, security concerns. Also, in the, in the consumer world, it's not really necessarily the case that regulation will work a lot. Um, I have an, a very shiny new example 
that was uh, basically it appeared online a couple of days ago uh, from Brussels. So I, I hope that not many people in this room have to worry about what Brussels does. But um, basically, the uh, so the um, European Union has a law for data protection that allows export of data only under certain uh, guarantees. So only if uh, so-called safe harbor provisions are met. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if the data goes outside the EU, uh, the other country needs to offer a, a reasonable a level of uh, a reasonably similar level of protection. And in a in a recent audit, the Commission arrived to the conclusion that given several recent developments that they will not stay and, and, and recount, the U.S. do not offer that level of protection. And the European Court of Justice raised the stick and said, well, you know, that means that under the, our own laws, you should immediately ask all European citizens not to use Facebook. Right, or Google. Or Google. Yeah. Or many other things. And that's not, just not going to happen. Yeah. Even, even if you wanted to protect your citizens. Yeah, you can't. You, you really can't. It would, be a, it would have mass riots in the, throughout the European Union yeah. like nobody has ever seen. So um, you can do only that much with regulation when it is oriented to the consumer. The consumer will want to do things their own way. Well, case. I think, I mean, I'm, I'm going to divert slightly the conversation here, but I think one, one potential consequence of the regulation, which is another c case of be careful what you wish for, is that because smaller companies do not want to bear, to bear their liability, they will more and more mo move towards the cloud, which means we will have the five or ten providers in the world that will become the equivalent of too big to fail for banks. So. I don't yeah, know. This if, is the, the risk aggregation. Right? Yeah, and I don't know like if any of you guys care about finance, but there's this awesome guy that writes this, this blog uh, on Bloomberg, uh, and he was talking about how do you audit the uh, balance sheet of a bank, and the answer is you don't because it's way too complicated. Uh, so we will get to a point where how do you audit Google and the answer is you don't because it's way too complicated. So th that's another huge yeah, risk. Yeah, they're actually already, I, I mean. Well, yeah. Well, that's already the thing, is, right? It's like what's the equivalent of, of too big to fail in cyber or what's the equivalent of, you know. Uh, too big to check. Well, like, or yeah, the <laughs> what's the systemic risk, right? Like what happens if for whatever reason, I don't know, Amazon is found liable for something and they, be forced into bankruptcy for to invent some reason. What happens? Nobody knows. Right. And how do you model that? You probably can't. And so you're, yeah, you're entering in these areas of big unknowns. And the other thing I like to point out is you move to these clouds, you see debates in companies that say, the debate goes something like this. A, nation, a foreign nation state is attacking me. We'll pick the Sony example. You know, North Korea is attacking Sony. The U.S. government should protect me because I pay my taxes and I'm a U.S. company. That's really great and self-serving for Sony because they get to transfer all liability and risk to the taxpayer, to the government. So on one hand, you could say, yes, well, you know, if, if Sony was physically attacked, that's a government response. But they're electronically attacked, so all of a sudden, Sony, you don't have to spend a penny on defense. You just shift all liability to the government. It's like, that's very convenient for you. And so... We're in this area where we don't understand the rules of the game. Like, what is a corporate responsibility? What are you responsible for? And then when do you get to shift the liability to somebody else, right? And so that's a shifting line in the sand. Yes, sir? Thank you. You discussed uh, liability and, and how market how pressure and how, how companies would, would become liable. And you looked at uh, policymakers and things like that. But the real pressure is the market pressure right. and and who has stopped buying gadgets from whatever company because of a breach uh, even though it was published we know the implications right. and the comparison with the airline industry um, is not quite correct at that point because if I knew that 90% of the planes are going to crash I wouldn't take the plane right. even well, though I know a different airline, right? of any airline if I look at only two manufacturers for planes yeah and if if though we, we acknowledge today uh, it's not a question um, 
if I'm going to be hacked, but when, then I consider that I'm going to crash at some point. And that's apparently well, there's acceptable. degrees of crashing. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Apparently, apparently that's acceptable. Yeah. Um, but I'd like to come back to um, the point of trust in technology. And I think it's uh, where I would like to, to ask the question if it's not only uh, the technologies that, that we know and the policies that we push, but also those institutions that stay out of policy, for example, uh, law enforcement or secret agencies that undermine the trust that we have in technology. Because even though we will have market pressure saying, I want to have secure products. Mm -hmm. And even though there will be policies saying you have to disclose it and there will be punishments, there are some entities staying outside and maybe driving uh, weaknesses in algorithms, uh, as you pointed it out, that will go unpunished because they're out of policy. What do you think about that? Yeah, so Thank I you. think the marketplace will punish companies that are too complicit with these forces. For now. Yeah, but then, like, I guess the other the, the question I might have for you is, what is the difference between like, would you rather Google have your data or would you rather the NSA? I would prefer the NSA or the FSB or whatever intelligence agency you want to pick, uh, because they're the, not monetizing. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> realistically, they're not going to send shit at my place because right. I need to buy stuff. Uh, so. So no, but I, I guess the point I was trying to make is that the like there are two issues here. Like one issue is is it acceptable to be act? For most people, the answer is yes because there are fail-safe uh, mechanisms for the stuff that actually hurts you as a person, which mostly today involves invo around credit cards uh, and potentially identity thefts. Uh, and there are comp like credit cards companies are essentially absorbing the, extra, the bad externality of potential fraud on credit cards. And distributing it across all participants. Yeah. Yeah. And there are companies that are trying to deal with identity thefts. So the pro, like the, the, I think the issue is that there's not going to be a market force in, on the consumer side, at least not on the security issues. Uh, the, I think a big problem, and a problem that I would love to see solved is, is there... Is there a way to shift the market dynamics so that we do not rely on company to collect data on people? Because then, if we can do that, at that point, the, the real problem, like, at that point, we can easily go to the NSA and be like, okay, you should not, like, you should really stop collecting because now it's just you. Uh, while, as of today, is yeah. every intelligence agency plus my four friends plus a lot of companies. Uh, I think like that, that like that, that is a way bigger issue and, a, and an issue that it's a lot harder to solve because that actually involves market forces, which is not an answer to what you were asking, but it's a problem that I would like to see solved. So, so we only have like one or two minutes left. So I just want to uh, ask, okay, we'll take one last question and then we'll... Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, we just now discussed about uh, there are fewer people now who, who are actually doing that low level stuff compared to the higher level stuff. So from my level, what I see is that um, uh, there is tremendous amount of change in this security space because the technology is evolving very fast. So one morning I wake up, all of a sudden I have to look at the 10 year old SSL implemented code, open SSL codes and all. And maybe next day, uh, let's say I'm a security researcher and my company thinks that there is huge amount of potential right. and big data for security guys. So all of a sudden I have an assignment to work on let's say data analytics. So what I think is that maybe, um, let's say I'm someone who is into security for last four years. So I might not have a good understanding of how things were, let's say 10 years back. Right. So, so what would be your, your take on it? I mean, how, would, how can we bridge that gap? How can we make sure that there is a uniformity between people who have just now entered into security, let's say just five years from uh, 2006 or seven, and about things that might have been affecting us, say, for, for far back times. I mean, that's an education and awareness issue, right? So how do you make the current generation be aware of the prior work so they're not repeating it, essentially? Well, that's... Right, right. 
right? Right, the, there are 10 different styles, yeah. So the complex, it's just the complexity question. Right, so, and that goes back to the generalist versus the specialist, and, and, and at one point, I think Dan Gear at the at oh, Black yeah. Hat USA had a really good point where he thinks he's, when he retires, he'll be sort of second to last generation of generalists that kind of understands how everything works. And, but nowadays, to get ahead in your career, you have to be a specialist. And you don't get the leeway to be quite as much of a generalist. And so what happens when you have a whole bunch of specialists building systems and no generalist to tell them how it all plays together? You know? that, that's, a, that's a very serious challenge for security because security is holistic, right? Security is systems. It's, whole, yeah, it's, it, it's system. looking at the whole system and trying to figure out how to, how to break it when it's all put together. And this is actually, uh, this is actually not... It, it's not a new question. It's something that, I mean, when you build an airplane, it's not like there's anybody who knows everything, every single detail. But there are people who can generalize the, the, the abstract, the single pieces yeah. and put together the whole airplane. And we need to be able to keep, to, to retain. That's one of the few things that I might disagree with them here on, is that we need to fight to retain the general, the general point of view. In, and, and at the same time, have a lot of specialists that look at the specific issue because those will be very complicated. But we still need to have people that are able to, uh, you know, encompass different right. specialties. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for the uh, great questions and staying for the last session here and for making Black Hat Singapore a big success. So we'll be, we'll be around for a while, and I would love to continue the conversation, and hopefully we'll see you next year. So thank you very much for coming. Give our panelists a round of applause. That's it. That's it. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Oh, I have to go to the